All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Leonard. I'm here today to talk to you guys about the seafood industry. We're going to learn about where your seafood is from, how it's farmed, and most importantly, what it's been fed. So without further ado. Okay. So over 50% of the uh, seafood uh, in the United States is currently produced in a way called aquaculture. Aquaculture is the aquatic farming of plants and animals for human consumption. And we have all sorts of different species that are currently farmed. We have tuna, salmon, we have mussels and clams. We also have industrial protein inputs like algae and seaweed, which ladies use in their cosmetics, is present in our ice cream, and we use it as biofuel. Since 1980, the uh, aquaculture industry has massively expanded, as you can see by the bottom graph. And this is mainly due to decreasing wild populations, advancing technology on a global scale. And we also have like, an increasing demand for seafood. People are starting to like seafood more. It's, it's better for us than red meat. But here in the United States, we've done a pretty bad job with the aquaculture industry. We've done a little bit of work with shellfish. We create some mussels, but that's about it. And what that leaves us with is a $16.1 billion trade deficit when it comes to seafood. This is our largest agricultural, um, ag agricultural import. So it's extremely important for us to know where our seafood co is coming from, and we don't really know anything. Now, another scary thing about us importing all of our seafood is that every country has different regulations and standards for how they grow their animals and how they grow their seafood. And this was something that I wanted to study and really get to know better in the future. So rather than going abroad for three or four months, I decided I would buy an around-the-world ticket, and I would spend my next six or seven months traveling around the world and getting to know the seafood industry. And I wanted to be able to combine my love for fish and my love for diving, and aquaculture happened to do that. So there was three places that really stood out to me on my trip that I wanted to talk to you guys about. The first of which is the Marlboro Sounds in New Zealand. And the Marlboro Sounds in New Zealand produce some of the most high quality seafood in the world. They do salmon production, they also have the production of the green mussels. Um, this is a salmon farm. They're about the size of a football field and New Zealand has about 12 of them. They're absolutely massive. They're producing hundreds of tons of seafood a year. And what's unique to New Zealand is the fact that they have no disease in their waters. So unlike a lot of other agricultural uh, products, in fish, livestock alike, they don't have to use antibiotics in their feed. So they're producing some of the most high quality premium seafood, no antibiotics, and it's essentially organic. They are way ahead of the rest of the world in the seafood industry. A big contrast from New Zealand was Chantaberry, Thailand. This is where the US gets a majority of their shrimp. Shrimp's currently the largest, or largest seafood import we have. It's about $4.1 billion deficit. And shrimp in Thailand is grown with a lot of different uh, regulations and restrictions than we have in the United States. They let them do a lot of different things. So this is a shrimp farm. Again, it's absolutely massive. What they do is they dig massive, um, massive ponds in the ground. And rather than taking like, good environmental control, they, they've, it's very hit or miss. Some farms do great jobs, some farms do bad jobs. And what we see right here on the next picture is we see pond water going into the environment right next to these farms. This, this pond water is dirty and they can't use it to grow fish anymore. Rather than cleaning it, they just let it go into the environment, killing all the trees, plants, and brush. But of all the places I went, there was one, one location that really stood out to me the most, and that was Port Lincoln, Australia. And for all of you guys who know about the Japanese love for sushi, this is where they get it from. Port Lincoln's a small town. It's about eight hours from the rest of... Um, from the, from the nearest city. It's about 20,000 people, and their entire industry is based around the production of southern bluefin tuna. Now, how they catch, uh, how they catch tuna in Port Lincoln is a lot different than, than you would expect. What they utilize is a process called seining. Seining involves, first of all, a spotter plane. The spotter plane will go out to sea. They're going to find big circling pools of southern bluefin tuna. And then they transmit the locations of those schools of tuna to a seiner ship. The ship will go out to sea, find the tuna, They'll drop a giant net that's absolutely massive, and they'll go around and circle the entire school of fish. And that's not where it ends. In order to maximize their profits, they, they circle the fish, attach it to the boat, and over the next 30 days, and at a speed of one to two mile, uh, knots, they bring it back to port, all the way back to Port Lincoln. When the tuna reaches Port Lincoln, they transfer the, they transfer the tuna to tuna cages, and for the next six months, they double the tuna's weight by feeding it. And the tuna get fat, they're a lot more expensive, and they're twice as valuable in the Japanese market. Now, as many of you know, the Japanese are very particular about the aesthetics of their fish. They want their fish to look good, they want it to have like, a great appearance so it can fetch the highest, uh, highest price on the international market. So when they harvest the fish, they use an extremely unique technique known as tuna wrangling. And what they do is they put tuna divers into the water, they'll go and they'll find a fish, they're usually about 500 inside of a smaller net, 
They'll grab the fish, they'll put it onto a conveyor belt, will be brought up and will be killed. And what this does is it preserves how the fish looks and it also minimizes the stress before the fish is killed, making the meat still taste good. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see me with the fish. Yeah, I got to go out there and be a tuna diver, it was awesome. And here is a tuna pen from like a little higher view. You can still see there's four divers in the water. The smaller net is what their quota is for the day. It's usually about 500 fish. And they'll harvest that, put it on the conveyor belt, which is the big thing going in the water, and then they'll kill him. So the overall goal of my trip was to try and find some sort of trend within the aquaculture industry. And what I found was all of the aquaculture that we're seeing right now is extremely dependent on forage fish as a feed. So when we have these tuna coming back to port, or we have these shrimp in ponds, or these salmon, they have to be fed forage fish. They're just the baseline protein in the ocean, they're really high in protein, and they're really low in fat. But the most important thing is that they, not, or they have omega-3s in them, which are extremely important in a fish's metabolism and in their like, cellular health. So what's really unique about forage fish is they're, they're filter feeders. They eat phytoplankton. They filter it through their gills, and they're able to create it into animal biomass. Uniquely, this phytoplankton they eat has omega-3s, and omega-3s aren't naturally synthesized in fish. They have to get them through their diet. So when these forage fish eat, eat the phytoplankton, they're getting omega-3s in their body. Then when bigger fish eat the forage fish, they're also getting the omega-3s. But there's a lot, of, a lot of bad stuff that's currently happening with um, our collection of forage fish and how we're capturing them. And when forage fish is sold on the international market, it's not just sold as a whole fish. It's sold as a product that's been ground, evaporated, and dried, and it's called fish meal. And by selling it as fish meal, it elongates the time the, uh, we can use the product. It's not, it doesn't have to be fresh. But what's happening is we're having some big things happening, like over, overfishing. If we kill all of the uh, little fish in the ocean, there's no more big fish that we like to catch. And in places like Chile and Peru, where they're, they're catching all of the fish meal, the, farm, uh, the, the fishermen are having to go to greater distances to catch their fish. It's getting a lot more expensive, and the value of this product's greatly increasing. But the biggest problem of all is supply is far less than demand. About 56% of fish meal right now is going towards aquaculture. 87% of fish oil, also derived from forage fish, is also going towards aquaculture. And this has caused a huge price skyrocket in the value of this. It's an internationally traded commodity. It's gone from about $750 in 2003 to over $2,300 this year. So it's, it's, it's getting really expensive. And the big thing that's happening is, is uh, feed producers and, and farmers are no longer able to use fish meal just because of the high cost. They're having to replace portions of the fish meal. So now they're only using maybe 25% fish meal with other things that aren't natural to a fish's diet. So when looking for things to use for like a substitute uh, for fish meal, due to the price increases, we have about th we have three things that we're using. We have oil seed, animal byproduct, and as we talked about before, we have fish meal. Oil seed are things like soy, canola, and um, corn. They're the major cash crops in the United States. We're using them because they're cheap. They also have a lot of protein. But the major problem with these inputs is they're they're extremely water and land, uh, land intensive when they're farmed. We've pretty much maximized our farming space. But a bigger thing is they possess something called anti-nutrients, and anti-nutrients inhibit the digestibility of a feed. So if we feed a fish a diet of oil seed, they don't really process it at all, it's kind of inefficient, and that's a really big problem. But what we're seeing for the future is kind of interesting. We're starting to see further genetic, uh, genetic modification of these products, so that these are going to be producing omega-3s probably in the next five to ten years. They're also going to be lowering the amount of anti-nutrients present. So in the future, we're going to see a lot more oil seed production for, for animals, and it's going to be a lot better than it is now. The second source of industrial protein we're using to replace fish meal in the diets of fish and other animals has been animal byproducts. These are slaughterhouse wastes. Um, they're sold in the form of bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, and poultry byproduct. And the problem with these inputs is they're really high on the food chain. So they've been fed diets of antibiotics themselves. Then we're just taking the leftovers from what we don't eat and we're feeding it to our animals. So these animals are getting fed antibiotics on top of the antibiotics they're already getting fed. It's a really big problem. Um, in 2012, um, a combined study between Johns Hopkins University and the American Chemical Society looked at 12 different types of feather meal sold in the United States. Two of them were from China, 10 of them were from the, uh, from the US. And what they found was the international, the international feather meal was really, really high in antibiotics. And not just one type, they had upwards of 10 different types of antibiotics in their feed. And on top of that, they were also using antidepressants like Prozac. They found Prozac in both the animal feeds for, for in Chinese, in Chinese uh, feather meal. And they're also using antihistamines. And the problem with this stuff is, even though we cook, we cook the feather meal and stuff, to, to, like we say we cleanse it, it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually like, offset 
the antibiotics. These things are, are heat resistant. So no matter what we do, they're still going to be in this feed. And this feed's not only being like, fed to animals in China, it's being brought to the US. And we're feeding this to our animals here. And the problem with using international like, feather meal is the fact that there's different regulations and standards. Like, again, we don't, the, some of the antibiotics they're using are illegal here, and it, they're, you know, they're not that very good for you. In the 10 US samples that we looked at, we also saw between two and six antibiotics in the samples. But what we saw was really interesting is we're still seeing illegal antibiotics being used in the US industry, things that were outlawed in 2005 because we use them in the treatment of humans. We're starting to see them in our feather meal now even though they're outlawed. And this is bad because it promotes antibiotic-resistant bacteria and can lead to the outbreak of pretty big diseases. So what's the future of this problem? How do we, how do we solve the animal feed problem? What can we feed that's better than what we're using right now? We need the next generation of feed, and that's going to be something that's environmentally beneficial. It needs to be high in protein, and it needs to be at the bottom of the food chain. We can't be feeding, we can't be feeding our animals things that have already been fed antibiotics, already been given pharmaceuticals, things like that. The hard part with finding the next generation of animal feed is going to be increasing the survival of the animals who consume it, and also reducing the ingredient costs. And reducing the ingredient costs is what's going to be the, the biggest problem. So we have, two, we have two samples that we can use, or two things we can use for the future. The first of which is insect, uh, insect matter. And right now we have some insects known as black soldier fly larvae. They're the baseline decomposers for pretty much our earth. When organic matter dies, black soldier fly larvae go and they consume the organic matter. There are decayers on earth. And what's really cool about these guys is they're really low on the food chain. You guys are all probably thinking like insects, that's disgusting. But I think it's a lot cleaner than like poultry byproducts and stuff like that. We can, feed, we can feed these things our waste. So we can use our organic waste. It's about 14% of, of our municipal waste right now is organic foods and yard waste, yard scraps. We can, we can take this out of the municipal waste, feed it to our black soldier fly larvae who will decompose it. They create an organic fertilizer with the byproducts they have left, and we're also make, are able to make massive quantities of black soldier fly larvae. But perhaps the, perhaps the uh, industrial feed that has the most hope for the future is algae. Uh, we have this one, one type of algae right now known as spirulina. Spirulina is one of the most amazing algaes like, in the entire world. To humans, it's known as a superfood. It's a blue-green algae. You guys can see the tablets up there. But what's really unique to spirulina is it has 20 times the amount of protein as corn. It also uh, makes omega-3. So this is just like what the fil uh, filter fit or fil forage fish are filtering with their, uh, with their gills. The big problem with using algae is we need to be able to scale this project up to a massive scale. And the big question is, how do we do that while making it economically feasible? My idea for this is we have, we, have, we have power plants right now. And power plants produce a lot of carbon dioxide. They have to offset their carbon dioxide. There's carbon tax credits, things like that. They have to pay to the government. Instead of doing this, we can go and we can build massive algae farms that are essentially feeding off the carbon dioxide from these, from these power plants. And we're able to grow massive quantities of algae while benefiting humans and creating an, uh, like an animal feed that's far better than what we're feeding them right now. So I'll leave you with this. You are what you eat. You got to be careful with the food we eat. We need to be careful with knowing how it's grown, uh, how it's farmed. But the most important thing of all is what these animals are being fed, because that directly translates over to you and your health. We don't want to be eating antibiotics more than we need to. This is going to create an outbreak of disease in humans. And uh, this summer, I'll be working at the Fish Technology Center working on this problem. And thank you.